next guest. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Wolfer. She's getting her books organized the way she wants them. There we go. So tonight's guest is Jocelyn Jackson, who is the New York Times and USA Today bestselling author of 10 novels. And her books have been translated into more than a dozen languages. Jocelyn is a former actor, and she's also an award-winning audiobook narrator, and she does the audio for her own books, but she also narrates for other writers, which is always fun to see her name pop up in the audiobook. Um, she serves as a member of the board and works as a volunteer teacher for Reforming Arts, which because of Jocelyn is now a charity that is near and dear to my heart, a nonprofit that is dedicated to bringing liberal arts higher education to Georgia prisons that are designated for women. And it's just like, look it up afterwards. We'll probably talk about it in the chat, but just they do amazing work. And I, I love that she kind of brought that into my world because I didn't know about it before you got involved. Um, what else? Let's see. So with her ninth novel, Never Have I Ever, she completely flipped genres and flipped the script from being sort of a contemporary Southern women's fiction writer to straight up like post racing, page flipping, domestic suspense, and the book that we are going to talk about tonight, Mother May I, she has like ramped it up to like the nth degree with the suspense part of it. So welcome Jocelyn, so happy to have you here. And I wanna talk a little bit about the book, but I wanna first talk about, with Never Have I Ever, I got a galley of it. And when I read it, I said, oh my God, she is like going completely away from sort of your traditional Southern stories, but all of your books have been like twisty turny anyway. So would never have I ever, did you intentionally like kind of move into something different or was that just completely spontaneous? Now, I think I've always been kind of a frustrated mystery and suspense and thriller writer. Like if you read my first eight books, I always kill somebody. There's always a murder mystery or the engine of a thriller. Like it really is women's fiction. The pace is slower there's more it's it's a lit i you know both of the i don't know i still think i've stayed in the realm of book club fiction because i i write about women's issues and social justice issues no matter yeah. what the format is but um but it's a different pace and a different focus like um you know it's more about family relationships whereas this is got a bigger more mm -hmm. engine but there was always a buried murder mystery in my women's fiction. Right. And when I started writing Never Have I Ever, I think that I, I got, I, I, I hit my 50th birthday and my give a crapper broke. <laughs> I, I think I've always been so worried, like, yeah. what if people don't think I'm real nice? You know, I'm real nice. Mm -hmm. And so I think I've always wanted to write these kind of books but just didn't and then I think I've been reading more of them the genre just really taken off in the last years and writing's a conversation like the more you read the more it influences you so I yeah. started writing it and I got about a third of the way in and I was like oh crap mm -hmm. this suspense novel <laughs> <laughs> what? Hey, your voice is so solid no matter what you're writing so even with never I think that's like what I wrote in my review that like your voice is ever present even if I if I had a blind read, I still would have known that was you. Oh, that's about the nicest thing you can say to me because I do, I love really voicey writers, and I like to, I yeah. like that I'm a voicey writer. I feel like a oh, you are. Thank you. But then I got the galley from Mother May I, <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> thank you. It just went. I mean. Yeah. Yeah, that was a goal was like, how do I start this off in a way that's very immediate? So for those of you who don't know, Mother May I hear a story about a woman named Bree who um, was raised kind of barely middle class, like not food insecure, but like a family situation where if 
the car broke down, you might be eating beans for four months. Like there's no, there's no room. And, but she got some good opportunities and she was lucky and she was, she, she got a, co- a scholarship. She's been really upwardly mobile. She's made a really advantageous marriage to some old South money. And by the time we meet her 38 years old, she has two middle school girls and they just had an oops baby, Robert, about 10 weeks ago. And she's married to a very wealthy lawyer, up and comer who, whose family are, his parents are like one percenters. They are very upwardly mobile, wealthy people. Um, and one day at her daughter's play recital, she's watching her daughter sing. She looks away for a minute. And when she looks back, Robert is just, he's gone. And where his car seat is, is a note that says, don't go home. Don't call your husband. Don't call the police. If you ever want to see your kid again, do exactly what I say. And because it's one of my books, if you've ever read one of my books, mm-hmm. you know it's not a straight up kidnap and ransom book. Like in my books, the past has a pulse and it has teeth and it's coming for you. you know, like there's <laughs> oh, yeah. reasons. And so that's she- the thing about it. But I want you to finish like the next part of that. And then I want to yeah. go back to how you know it is a Jocelyn Jackson book. No, no. I mean, I feel like that's enough to say, don't you? Yeah. I don't want to spoil it. It's It's so... It's easy to talk to you about the book and your writing, but this one is the kind of book that everything needs to be revealed as the reader turns the pages. Like, like more, that's the most bare bones. Yeah. Here's something to get your pulse races, but what you think is happening is not what is, I mean, you're going to have fun and there's a lot more to it than that. Let's yeah. Just that. And I love going back to what you were saying about your books being book club books, but this one is like a beach book. And it's also a book club book and it just, anyone could read it. It's not, you know, I, I just have a thing about women's fiction because I feel like a man could read this book and be as enraptured as when I read, you know, Lee Goldberg. Like I, I, I like that you kind of genre bust anyway, but I really stress that this book is not just for women. And well, you've got I mean, a male narrator in there too. It kind of is just for women. And I'll tell you why. <laughs> because women are the ones who read fiction. So I think it's ridiculous that they call a genre of fiction women's fiction. Mm-hmm. Because I promise you, Lee Child, mm-hmm. the vast majority of his readers are women. Mm-hmm. I'm a huge Lee Child reader. So a lot, you know, I, I think that's silly. I also think that the world would be a better place if men read more fiction. Mm-hmm. Fic- fosters empathy it teaches you empathy which is a thing that i think would be you know one of the it's which comes first the chicken or the egg do women yeah. read because we're more empathetic or are women more empathetic because we read so uh, yeah i think it kind of goes both ways and i also think like um the the idea behind women's fiction is this is a story that has women at the center of it. So why would a man be interested in reading that? Is so basically insulting. Mm-hmm. It's it's like there's this sort of hierarchy of interest where if you are a middle class white guy, that's a story everybody's interested in. Mm-hmm. And then like if you are, then you lose all those guys. If you are a man of color, maybe these people would be interested in it, but right. not these people. And then if you're a woman, you lose, you know, all the men of color. And then if you're a woman of color, you lose all the way. Like it just keeps going down. Yeah. Where if 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 you're if you if you can't see yourself reflected in the book, then this is not a book for you. Like that is that goes against everything that writing is supposed to do, which is put us in another pair of shoes, take us on a journey. Yeah. And you touch on so many things in this book always, like you said, your books always deal with social justice and like women's issues or maybe the inequities that women have to deal with yeah i also just like women's issues because it puts the onus on women to fix all the things that are wrong. right which is why i was hesitant to even say that but this book like of course the past is ever present and there's like themes of you know shame and justice and revenge and you know motherhood and 
who gets second chances, who gets 25 chances, who gets right. one chance, who gets zero chances, you know. And you also, know, like, class. Economic disparity. Yeah. 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 And I, but you, huge in this book. I, you put it in there, but it's all, like, it's all woven together so tightly and neatly that you realize it that you're not like slapping us in the face with it it's very subtle but it's part of the story it's just so great and then at the end it's so powerful i got real emotional towards the end but oh thank you i did yeah. too i did yeah. too I'll, I'll tell you like this book is very personal to me and i did have a, i had a lot of big feelings writing this book and i'm glad that that you did too because yeah, yeah. so because I know you well, and I know I've read all your books, I know for you, character usually comes before plots. Yeah. And so I'm assuming it was the same with this. Yeah, even switching to more, you know, plot-centric books that are definitely a little more twisty and with a stronger narrative drive. I, I really have to be interested in the people or I don't want to write about them. And I want them to be layered and I want them to have stuff going on and I want, you know, we're, we are, we are, we are nurture and nature. So I want people yeah. to be their essential selves, but I also want them to be like, mm -hmm. um, the, where the past, everything that all the choices they've made and all the things that have happened to them and all the things they've discovered kind of go into the kind of person they are and the kind of choices they make. So the, the more I know the characters, the easier it is to write the book because something will happen and then like what makes the chapters deciding like, what's their response to this? How are they going to act upon this new information they have or this new thing that's happened? And so mm -hmm. it, like it really all, all of the action comes, I mean, there's a lot of action in this book, but it comes out of who these people are. It's not a simple thing of like, if a gun goes off, all the horses start running because it's a mm -hmm. horse race. It's really specific to who these people are, which I think is what makes you care about them. Is there's yeah, Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Up. So I also know that you you hate writing. <laughs> I do. I hate writing so much. And, <laughs> but you love revising. I do. I love to revise. But if you don't write, you don't have anything to revise. So yeah. it's like you have to do this <laughs> terrible thing. It's like I I don't really love baking, but I do love to eat cookies. <laughs> So you have to put the ingredients in the bowl. And then like, I like to decorate. It's, it's actually more than that. Like, cause I, I spend probably 20% of my time writing, which is the part I don't like. Mm -hmm. And 80% of my time conservatively revising. Like that's really where the bulk of my time and energy goes. Cause that's what I enjoy. Right. So I just spew it out. Like I'll spew out a couple of chapters as fast as I can. And they'll be terrible. Blah, and it's a horrible week of work. Yeah. And then I'll spend multiple weeks revising those and having the best time. So then I feel it is safe to say that you are not a plotter. I am not. I'm a <laughs> pantser. I'm a pantser. Yes. Shameless pantser. Do you think that, and I don't think I've ever even asked you this question before, but do you think that your background as an actor, and I know you also wrote plays a long time ago, do you think that that sort of um, enhanced your skill set as a writer oh. or is it like completely? No, it is so connected. Um, it, it's weird. I'm, I am, I'm just going to, one of the things about being over 50 is that I just own stuff that I'm good at. Like I used to apologize if I was going to say I was good at something, but you know what? I'm good at writing novels and I'm a good actor. Yeah. I'm, I'm not a very good playwright. I'm not a bad playwright. I can write a serviceable play and it's funny and it's fine and it's structurally whatever, but all of that happens up here and it's really thinky and like that acting and novel writing all come much lower from like my reptile brain. Like it's very <laughs> instinctive. And, and it, I think that like my training as an actor and my work as an actor turned me into a novelist because if you're a playwright, you have to write something as if it's a perfect skeleton Mm -hmm. And you, there has to be room for actors and then there has to be room for well, a director, their vision, come, there's your vision overlaid by the musculature of a director's vision overlaid by the skin and fur and facial features and sprouncy bows of the <laughs> actors. 
And so you have to write a skeleton. I don't want to write a skeleton. I want to write an animal. And yeah. acting is about, even though you're only one piece, you do have to create a whole animal that works within this whole. And I, I like that. I like that control where I make this thing and it's mine and then it's done and it's, it's reactive and interactive, but it's, it's whole and it, it comes from here and it's yeah. feels very the same. I know that sounds really woo woo, but it's true. No, it doesn't. It makes total sense. Um, and it's so funny because I think one of the reasons you're such an awesome audio book narrator is that background, but it's, interesting i i'm you know a physical book person oh i have that on my tbr list yeah i loved it yes it's set in the 80s and it's about a young lawyer and a who sort of becomes an influence in this young girl's life and i came of age kind of between the lawyer and the young girl like i'm writing and so both of them in some ways it was like reading um like my autobiography, like it, oh, it, wow. it, it hit home in so many ways. Jen Phillips, one of my favorite writers, but I, I was very excited to do that. I read Lucia. There's two voices, the, the lawyer, which is me and the young girl, which is a young girl named Grace Experience. Oh, so. awesome. But it's gotten to the point now, even though I do listen to some audiobooks, but I'm not in the car enough to like really get like my right? weight. And it's hard for me to do it like at home. Me too. So, and I, but I still love the weight and feel of a book, but it is to the point that now when I read your books, I hear your voice anyway. Oh, that's so funny. <laughs> so it's kind of like, I might as well have the audio, but I do love, um, I'm going to get that Jen Phillips book because it was on my list of things I want to read, which is, you know, pages and pages. But if it has your seal of approval, then I know I like it. Um Another thing that is like a trademark of your books is, you know, the stunning covers. They did such a good job with that. Look at that. And I know you have a lot of input on your covers. I do not. not I thought you did. Well, I mean, they're nice to me and I could, <laughs> I, I could like, I mean, of course I have first refusal, but they also do a meeting with me beforehand where we, mm -hmm. we conceptualize together and but I don't, I don't exercise, like I'm not a graphic designer and the, their graphic design team is so good mm -hmm. that a lot of times I'll, we'll have this meeting and I'll say my ideas that I think are so great. And then they'll come back with something that has nothing to do with it. That's so much better than my stupid idea. I'll be like, no, never mind. Let's do that. Let's do that. Yeah. Although this one in the concept meeting, one of the things I said was, let me put it up there, was I said, you should do something with a carousel. There's a huge scene that happens at a, a, a ruined carousel at a decaying amusement park. <laughs> Super creepy scene. And uh, they, they said, well, that it just didn't work. But then they got this little toy carousel in the grass. Like, yeah. so I feel like I had a little, but this is so much better than... The ruin, they showed me some of the ruined carousel colors. It, it covers, it wasn't good. And what's so, right? Yeah. You can see right there, mm -hmm. I have one of the little carousels, the exact carousel that was on the cover shoot. So, how, I can't remember which book it was, but I know you started sort of getting your stuff like a book souvenir that kind of like goes along with your novels. How many books ago was that? Oh, gosh, that was a while ago. I don't even know when I started that. Oh, Between Georgia. My second, was it Between Georgia? Okay. Yeah, my second book, my I, the little Nani's Little Fox doll. I had yeah. To, yeah, I like to be in conversation with other art forms. Like, and sometimes it's as simple as like this, the photographer used this carousel. So I got, I found the carousel mm -hmm. and bought it. Sometimes it's I have a quilt made because my character is a quilt artist and I get the actual artist that the character's work is kind of based on and commission yeah. her to do it. Or sometimes it's as simple as that. But I always do something like that where I, I'm in conversation with another medium. Maybe that's why I thought you had more input on the cover. I know you had like one photographer that you loved and they oh, did yeah. her work. So maybe that's where I got that. Oh, no. Yeah. Grown up kind of pretty. Uh, there's there's an art photographer who had done um, Backseat Saints. Love that cover. And um, I, I, Sig Harvey is her name. And I started following her and paying attention to her. Like she's a big deal. She's, mm -hmm. She has gallery shows everywhere. And, and she also does tons and tons of like commercial work. Mm -hmm. But she's also, uh, and 
one of her self portraits was so, I use art when I'm writing, like I'm a visual arts person. This picture was so evocative of the book's themes to me yeah. that I kept it up on my desk while I was writing. And I sent it to my agent, not about the cover, just like this Sig Harvey photo. And each time you read a Mosey chapter, this is what I was looking at. <laughs> and she sent it to my editor, just like not behind my back, but just kind of showed it to my editor. My editor was like, I love this. They contacted Sig Harvey and she's like, that is a self-portrait that has a really specific meaning to me. Let me read the book. And oh, she wow. Okay. Book and she was like, yes, you may have it. This book is about, well, like I had what, what the photo was about to her was mm -hmm. what I had written about. And oh yeah, that's great. It was really like a conversation. So that did uh, end up being the cover of a grown up kind of pretty. And I own a signed print of that. Yeah. Art down. I just always thought it was so kind of a neat thing that you keep that connection between your art and other creative artists and it just makes it even more special and I you know other writers might do that but you're the only one that I know for sure who does it and I so, love to do it yeah um so speaking of fun time <laughs> fun time is like the kind of place that I could totally see me sneaking into with you know a really good friend of mine and hoping that we don't die while we're there <laughs> so once again that came out of an art photographer i can't remember his name now it's, it's terrible but the series was called abandoned america mm -hmm. where he went to all these american places where the population has left and there are these decayed churches and trolley stations and theme parks and they're so horrifying and the theme park <laughs> pictures were the ones that really got to me so i i ended up having to set a huge couple of scenes in a piece of abandoned america yeah and i kept you laughing that and look at the pictures yeah <laughs> i will i love all that kind of weird you know like camera obscura all those like crazy places um, and I kept laughing in the book every time fun time would come up because I was like, this is so not a fun time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, same fun time. Fun time. Let's go fun time. <laughs> but yeah, so everybody like fun time is super creepy. And the way you <laughs> when you describe fun time, Jack, it is just <laughs> One time Jack is upsetting. I read too much Stephen King as a little girl. Like I read, I read, I must have, I read it like in high school. So yeah. Okay. <laughs> One time Jack is the direct descendant of Pennywise, I think. <laughs> so um, before I forget, I have to remember, speaking of our friends, my friend Keila, I think she's probably watching. She wanted me to tell you that she's been a fan since Backseat Saints and she loves your books and that Birchie is the best character ever. Oh, thank you. I love Birchie. Birchie's in a book called The Alma Sisters. It's my last piece of women's fiction. I often say, and I think there's some truth to this, to this, that I think writers are trying to say something. And I had been trying to say something about the South because I mm -hmm. love the South in this really ambivalent way. Like I love it and I'm so angry with it. Like yeah it's, it's a visceral thing and so in several books for eight books i was trying to say something about the south and in the almost sisters i said it i said yeah. i'd been trying to say and i don't feel like i have to try to say that anymore now i'm saying other things with guns. right <laughs> with guns. um so let's see i want to talk we got just a few minutes left so i want to talk about reforming arts sure because i feel like it is a nonprofit that many, many people should know about. And even if you don't live in Georgia, you can still support it. And you so, should. so would you just tell us briefly about that? Um, Reforming Arts mission is to bring liberal arts, higher education into Georgia's prisons that are designated for women. And we work in partnership with a lot of really great nonprofits. Uh, and we also work in partnership with Georgia State. That's where we get our accreditation. Um, and we're currently in two prisons and we're looking to expand that to two facilities. Um, 
and right now, just because of the way things have been, we've spent the last year really focused on our reentry program where mm -hmm. we take reentering citizens and work with them to help them continue their educational opportunities outside of prison, complete degrees they began while they were incarcerated or take the degrees they've earned while incarcerated and help them parlay that into job opportunities or provide trauma processing support, like mm -hmm. re-entering, especially if you're in car, the way technology has moved, yeah. the world is not the same world and navigating that is very difficult. Um, so, and, and community creating and, you know, being part of those communities. So, and, and that is like, to me, like, it's one of the things that Mother May is really about. Like, I am a person who I have a very checkered past. I was not, I did not, I did not make good choices <laughs> all the time. I didn't make good choices, as we say to our yeah. now, yeah. but I, w I was born into a very loving family who was very stable in their relationships with each other and their community relationships. Huge advantage. No, almost no one I've ever taught in the prison comes out with that advantage. And we were also, um, we were also fiscally, um, when I was young, we, we were kind of like Brie, you know, I remember my mom lost a $5 bill in the grocery store and I remember her crying. Like she just sat down and cried because it changed her whole week, yeah. maybe longer than that. Cause she lost a $5 bill. Like it was bad, yeah. but we were never, we were never homeless. We were never hungry. We had clothes and my, my father was very upwardly mobile. They came from just nowhere, Alabama, nothing. And by the time I was ready to go to college, they were very solidly middle class with a bullet. Mm -hmm. And um, and so like that meant that when I began to make poor choices, I had all these ropes around me and mm -hmm. I failed out of college multiple times. I disappeared into Atlanta where nobody knew where I was for months at a time, like very bad choices. But there were always ropes on me pulling me back. And I was offered chance after chance after chance. Meanwhile, people who come out of true poverty mm -hmm. and people who don't have those stable family structures, they're the people who are going to end up in prison. And especially if they are people of color, it is almost impossible to have these circumstances and not expect to go to prison at some point in your life. The children of many of my incarcerated students think of themselves as people who will at some point go to prison. It's what you do in your life, that it's just normal. And that, it, and, and it, part of that is because sometimes they get no chances at all. And what's, what's, and that's so heartbreaking, but hard to even comprehend. Right. But sometimes they'll get a chance and they won't do it perfectly. And so they lose that chance and, and they have to do it. If, if somebody like me is less perfect I get a lot of excuses made for me, but if you get one chance and you already come in with all these preconceived notions about you, right. the smallest mistake can take the chance away. And then if that person goes tumbling off the world, it's very comfortable for people to say, well, she had a chance and she <laughs> blew it. And so it removes that responsibility from you to look at how many chances you've gotten and how imperfect you've been, because you can, it's easy to just, well, she was given this chance and she did not do a great job. She smoked right. pot or she, whatever she did that was, you know, imperfect. Never mind. Like if we're going to, if we're going to take the purity test, I'm not, I'm, I'm going to do great. Cause I'm going to lie. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if we're on Facebook live, I'm going to lie. Like nothing you've ever seen, but I'll tell you I'm lying. I'm just not going to tell you about which things. So, right. yeah. So like that to me, reform, what reforming arts is about is saying we shouldn't stop giving people, we shouldn't stop creating opportunity for people. If, if every person on this earth has a responsibility to create opportunity for other people on this earth, we yeah. need to be inviting each other and making room for each other. We all, everyone can do that. Yeah. For everyone. Well, I love it. And the stories that come out of the women 
who have participated and excelled and like moved out, especially with the anniversary program last year. I was. Oh, thank you for coming. I was like just weepy the whole time because it's so beautiful. So everybody watching, just look up reforming arts. Dot org. And if and, you're sitting there thinking to yourself, oh, what am I going to do with all this money? Let me help <laughs> you. Get the money shovel and just scoop it our way. We will put it to good use. And it's a tax deduction. Yeah, it is. I just, it's like a no brainer for me every year. I just, I, I love it. So um, before we wrap up, I just wanted to ask, are we are we firmly in suspense right now? Is that going? Is your next yes. book going to oh, be suspense? Yes. It's called My Little Eye. You'll see the deal for it coming out in Publishers Lunch pretty soon, and it should be out not this year but next year mm -hmm. at some point. And um, I'm more than halfway through with it right now. And hang on, baby. <laughs> Imagine after Mother May I, I don't even know. I'm like I might just need to. Like, I don't have like a Xanax prescription, but <laughs> I might need one writing it. I'm, yeah, it's pretty tense right now. Where we are right now, I'm like, I don't know if I can get her out of it. It's pretty bad. Oh, <laughs> you'll figure it out. You'll yeah. figure it out. Um, and then one last thing if you follow Jocelyn on Instagram, <laughs> she does a, I don't want to call it a show, but with her daughter. They eat things. <laughs> so you don't have to. We just, we find weird foods and it's probably culturally insensitive, except that I think no matter where you're from, yeah. there's foods that are going to be like, as a Southerner, I would love <laughs> to get a Yankee to do eat things so people, so other Yankees don't have to and get you some Southern stuff. Like that would be fun to me. Like we just did Spain. They yes. Weird <laughs> stuff in Spain. But now I tell you what we're doing next because I just, we're doing Hawaii. I just bought oh, yeah. weird stuff at the grocery store in Hawaii. So <laughs> we're going to eat some things. We're going to eat some things that are good, I hope. But there's also like some things that I, we're eating um, teriyaki fish jerky. Fish, okay. fish jerky. No. Yeah. I'm, um my brain it can't that doesn't click in my brain. I'm already like, no, 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 no. But we're gonna eat it. <laughs> well, I'll we'll tell you so you don't have to. I can't wait for that because the last one that I saw was the candy one. And I don't <laughs> <laughs> and I don't remember now because I blocked that terrible candy out, but you both like it was like simultaneous spitting that candy out. <laughs> it was hot. Chili mango gummy. Only twice have we had to spit food out of our mouths, and they were both sweet things from Spain, I think. Like, yeah, yeah. that one was great. Like, they're all so funny, but that one was just like you could not have if that had been like pre recorded, it was just perfect because you both like spit it out at the same time, like this horrified look. So, <laughs> seriously, just good. follow her on Instagram so that you can watch the next episode of We Eat Things so you don't have to. It's <laughs> <laughs> just a great fun way to end our chat, but I thank you for doing this. Oh, thank you, Carmen. It's always, I, I'm so excited to see your face with I my know. eyes. <laughs> I know, it's so hard. Like every time I do one of these with, you know, some of our local, I'm sorry, I'm just going to say it, but Atlanta, Georgia has the best book industry of any we do any i just don't even care so Can i just point out though just really quick that we are both wearing a silver chain a black t-shirt a black cardigan <laughs> and a little pointy self glasses we are wearing a uniform i need a hat and we're golden <laughs> we, well, we did not plan this i did not know this there was no memo about what to wear so but it's just always so much fun because we haven't been able to see each other in forever forever I so this was Yes, I miss you too. And hopefully this year, maybe we'll be able to see each other in real life. So. Wow. Wow, crazy. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> It'll be so weird to like touch people again, you know? No, it is weird. Thank you for having me. All right. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Good night, everybody. Good night. Goodbye.